Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast, the podcast where we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope that it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors of sexual abuse too. We hope that you find it interesting, but more than that, if you are a survivor of sexual abuse, we hope that you find our discussion empowering. My name is Alan Collins. I'm the part of the heads up the abuse team at Hugh James, and I'm joined by my colleagues today. And I have Anna Hobson, Kathleen Hallisey, and Daniel Vincent. Hi, Danny. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Anna. Hi, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi listeners. So in this podcast, we're going to be talking about sex offenders avoiding restrictions by using aliases to claim benefits and to apply for jobs, which would probably be totally inappropriate given their background and offending. But before we get into this particular podcast, I need to remind everybody that what we talk about in these podcasts can be distressing, upsetting, troubling, and so on. So if you think you may be upset or troubled in some way by this podcast, now's the time to switch off and go off and do something else. Otherwise, please do stay with us. So, as I said at the beginning, we're going to be talking about sex offenders using aliases in order to claim benefits and get jobs, that type of thing, which I suspect the vast, vast majority of us would say, no, that should not be allowed to happen. So we're talking about this because of a news report in GB News recently, where Charlie Peters at GB News, and I know Charlie very well, he's an excellent um, guy at GB News, in my experience, in dealing with some very difficult and troublesome and difficult subjects, produced a report showing how sex offenders have been able to use aliases in order to access benefits and obtain work that they would probably be denied if their true identity was known. And I think it's particularly topical, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Kathleen here, because we attended recently an all-party parliamentary group meeting at Westminster, where this issue of sex offenders being able to change their name without any kind of restriction was discussed. And in the wake of that, we had the Home Secretary announcing a law change to try and um, stop this particular practice. So I'm going to hand over to Kathleen, who can give us a little bit of an update on where we are with all of that. Thanks, Alan. I think, I mean, I think the update at this point is that the Home Secretary says there's going to be a change in the law, but that hasn't quite happened yet. And that was something that was said by the by the previous Home Secretary as well. I think the concern is what that law is going to look like. And as you have rightly pointed out in previous podcasts when we've discussed this issue of sex offenders changing their name by deed poll, is how are they going to be tracked? And the best way of doing so would be via national insurance number. So equally, I would think that if there was a law change or a policy change, whatever it was to look like, that claiming for benefits has to be done by a national insurance number. That in turn would flag up whether somebody is a sex offender and therefore potentially couldn't be claiming benefits or applying for certain types of work. So it seems to me that we're potentially missing a trick here in terms of how we need to track these types of offenders and that a national insurance number, which Again, Alan, as you rightly pointed out, you've given when you're born and it never changes throughout your life, regardless of how many times you change your name or how many aliases you use, is really going to be the best way to to track these individuals. Yeah, and this story beggars belief because it seems to me that the ability to check people using their NI numbers seems to have been either lost or compromised or not being used in the way that it ought to be used. And It's 2023, soon be 2024, and we hear every day about AI and information technology, you know, and so on. And I just struggle to understand why the powers that be dealing with all of this can't use a simple piece of information to help track the identity of these people. You're never going to have a completely foolproof system, I guess, but this would go a million miles in making it far, far more difficult for sex offenders to cheat their way somehow or other into, you know, making out that they're somebody that they're not in order to 
access benefits or work or heaven forbid children. I don't know if you feel the same way, Alan, but I felt like what came out of attending that the APPG on safeguarding and faith communities and the presentation by Della, who's promoting Della's law, which is a change in, in law regarding sex offenders being allowed to change their name by DPOL. A lot of what came out of that was really shocking to me. Mm. Um, and I felt like things that I should have known given the work that we do, but you know, there isn't any actual sex offenders register, even if people think there's some kind of national mm. database and we're relying on sex offenders to register themselves with probation. And I can't recall the statistics offhand that were quoted to us in that meeting, but it's thousands and thousands Thanks. and thousands mm. of sex offenders who have gone missing as such. So I feel like this problem just highlights the fact that we need a, a complete overhaul of how we're dealing with sex offenders, how we're keeping track of sex offenders, not just in relation to how they're claiming benefits, in relation to how they're changing their name by deed poll. And another recent headline around sex offenders still being allowed to have access to their own biological children, even while they're incarcerated and, and after they're released from prison and the fights that are going on in family courts around that issue. So it seems to me that this just highlights a huge issue around how we're dealing with sex offenders altogether. Yeah, it's almost as if we're not taking the subject seriously mm. in, in many ways. I just don't understand why someone accused of sex offences is brought into the police station, their details are taken, their national insurance number is logged at that stage. And then when they're, if they're convicted and sentenced, it's not that just their name that is registered, but their national insurance number. So when a DBS check is done, it should be not just the name, but the national insurance number. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that it's done just against the national insurance number, because I think what came out of that meeting was that DBS is not necessarily picking up on a change in name by people, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I think is, is terrifying for anybody, but particularly, you know, as a parent with young children, you'd be particularly concerned that somebody could be working in your child's school who is a sex offender, mm. has changed their name by default, but because of there being kind of a, I don't want to say loophole, but there's like a break in the system here mm. where it could mean that somebody is working in a, in a school with children who is a convicted sex offender and has kind of gotten through the net because they've changed their name. It's a good point because as I understand it from the EB News piece, what's been identified is that people in probation or wherever tapping in the information about the offender you know they can type in the wrong name mm. whereas no system is going to be 100 percent foolproof but if you've typed in the national insurance number and checks were done against the national insurance number whether you're doing a dbs check or the paying for benefits or whatever it happens to be at least there's that and you're not dependent on someone typing in the correct surname typing in the correct set of names, so to speak, and you've only got to have, you know, whether it's Smith with an I or a Y, you know, it would be a big, big difference. It can make um, a big a big difference um, ultimately in, um, in how good the system is, whereas if you're using the international insurance number, at least I think that enhances identification and deterrence. Well, the, the thing is here is that if somebody has committed these crimes and then are released, they go and, you know, if they're, they're wishing to reoffend, which sadly many people do, they're going to look for whatever loophole they, they can find. And frankly, if they're going into a position potentially, you know, we've talked about, for example, schools as a caretaker or, or what, whatever, that's, you know, really easy access to very young children. Mm. So I do think that, especially with this being publicised, people are going to be very aware that, that this could be a potential big, big loophole coming forward. Yeah, and I think if the, the law is just, you know, enacted to say, if you're a sex offender, you're not allowed to change your surname, given what we know about sex offenders, I don't think that's going to be much of a deterrent. I think they're the sort of people who just think, well, I'm above the law, I won't get caught, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, and even practical things like mm. actually, you know, if a sex offender comes out and then marries, remarries or whatever, mm. they, they would be changing their name mm. anyway. So, you know, having it linked to the national insurance number is going to cover whatever yeah. scenarios come in. So let's say Joe Gloggs is convicted in... UK and serves his sentence and travels to know, some half long corner of the world, changes his name there. How is this proposed system going to check up on him if he does that? He could stay out of the UK for years, may commit offences overseas using his new name. Um, there's all sorts of different scenarios. And as I said, there's no system that's going to be 100% foolproof, but 
in using the national insurance that that is an inhibitor, it's a sort of deterrence. And as I said, I think it can just aid tracking of these people. There does seem to be some sort of issue with that, though, because just having a read through the GB News report, a former civil servant also had the same idea and they did implement it within the system, within the process. And for some unknown reason, it was implemented for a few months and then it was, as they reported, removed for no apparent reason. Mm. So there's clearly some problem with it potentially but I'm guessing there'll be more on that and we'll, you know more will reveal why at the moment it doesn't really seem to be clear no you know as I said I think the ability must be there to do this and I just find it perplexing um that it's not happening um and if an attempt has been made why it hasn't been made to work I mean maybe it is really a situation of kind of the IT so to speak the kind of system itself mm not being available there isn't really a kind of central system yeah maybe systems don't talk to each other yeah and that the government maybe doesn't want to kind of admit that but there isn't kind of this central system where things can be checked Mm. and perhaps you know from a funding point of view perhaps don't want to invest the resources into funding that type of system but i would have thought there's some very bright minds in this country who could very easily come up with some type of system where people can can easily be tracked by their national insurance numbers and there'll be kind of a central database around that. Although, I mean, I'm sure there'll be loads of arguments around, you know, right to privacy, et cetera, but the truth is we're all being tracked (laughs) in some way. You know, you need your national insurance number to be able to access medical treatment and, you know, benefits, as we're pointing out in this podcast. So, you know, I can't see where there would be a huge issue in terms of right to privacy. I wonder that it's a a really an actual, very practical kind of systems thing. But it's not beyond the wit of man, I would have thought. No, it isn't. And it's something that, frankly, mm-hmm. is, is so critically important, not just in terms of protecting children from being abused, but also if you're kind of more interested in the pounds and pence argument, is that you know, the cost of treatment for people who have been sexually abused in relation to mental health and physical health problems is astronomical. So from a cost-benefit perspective, it makes sense. If you're looking at a balance sheet to invest the money in this to prevent for the victims. So some of the, the statistic is someone has worked out it costs the taxpayer forty thousand pounds per victim. For their lifetime or per annum? I think it's the cost, the cost of someone being sexually abused is forty thousand pounds per, per victim. Mm. So, you know, and there's lots of victims, you know. As we know, which we covered in previous podcasts, you know, it's yeah. I think figures are in the billions in terms yeah. of what the what the cost is to the kind of state. Yeah, to the, um, to the state, the economy. Yeah. Exactly. So again, if you're you know not interested in the kind of emotional kind of side of of this, and in terms of not wanting to people be hurt, and you're looking at it purely from a pounds and pence perspective, is the logical yeah. and practical yeah. decision yeah. to invest in this. So anyone listening out there who thinks they know how to get the government to join the dots, so to speak, please tell us. Yeah, and I mean, if you have experiences of this yourself, it would be really great to hear from you. So on that note, we better draw this podcast to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. And as always, out there listening in, if you have any thoughts or comments, please do get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you'd like to speak to us about something you've heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk.